I am happy to welcome you to this uh, inauguration of the latest addition to the Norwegian e-infrastructure here at NTNU in Trondheim. My name is Kolbjörn Norvik and I am going to guide you through this opening ceremony. Many researchers and scientists have been waiting for this moment for a long time. And uh, supercomputers come and supercomputers go. But they have told me that nothing beats the powering up of a grand new one. Always bigger computer, always more powerful and always capable of delivering some amazing computer uh, capacity. A lot of people have been working hard in order to come up with the program you're just uh, about to, to watch. And uh, we also get to uh, visit uh, the, the visit of some distinguished guests as we go along. The time lap you, uh, you just watched was the actual creation, or should I rather say installation of the computer itself, right here at the heart of Grösögen and Tanu. Actually, I think you will have to make a couple of wrong turns in order to find the machine, but I think that is the way they would like it to be. Before I do anything else, I would uh, run you through the program that you are going to take part in. First of all, I will be joined by Gunnar Bö, the managing director of Uninet Sigma 2. Uh, he will give us an introduction uh, to the importance and the recent history behind the new supercomputer and what role Uninet Sigma 2 plays in this. Next, we will get the story behind the name of the newest supercomputer. Uh, I guess you all know the name by now, but it's always nice to get some insights and the story behind it. We have been so fortunate as to gather some very competent people to help us with that. Professor Emeritus Kari Hag and Professor Peter Lindquist at the Department of Mathematical Science will help us with that. Then we will be introducing, uh, we'll get an introduction from two notable scientists that will tell us uh, what the new supercomputer can make possible in their line of research for the future. Andrea Gruber from Sintef Energy and uh, Andrea Reuter from the University of Bergen. Since they will be talking about subjects I know next to nothing about, I'm pleased that Gunnar Bö is going to be here in order to translate it some, uh, into my uh, level. We will also get a greeting from the um, supplier of the machine itself, Autos, and we will hear it from the Ministry of uh, uh, Research and Higher Education, Åse Marte Hoirimo. She will be speaking on behalf of the Norwegian government. And at the end, we will be giving you a virtual tour of the center of attention itself. But enough talk from me now. Uh, I will introduce you to uh, the real host of the day, Gunnar Bö, the managing director of Uninet Sigma 2. Thank Gunnar. you. Can you tell us a little bit about what Sigma uh, or Uninet Sigma 2 is and the connection to the new supercomputer? Yes, I will do that. Thank you, Kolbjörn. The ladies and um, gentlemen, um, Sigma 2 uh, was established uh, by the Research Council and the four oldest universities in uh, Norway. Uh, at the end of 2014 and given a strategic uh, responsibility for the national e-infrastructure for large-scale data and computational science in Norway. Sigma 2 also has the responsibility for the management and operation of this infrastructure, which we also call e-infrastructure. In addition, uh, Sigma 2 has the responsibility for international for participation in international collaboration uh, on e-infrastructure. 
and collaboration is a key word. We do this in very close collaboration with our partners at the four oldest universities in Norway. University of Bergen, University of Oslo, UIT, the Arctic University of Norway, and the Norwegian University of Science and Technology here in Trondheim. Uh, we have a virtual organization consisting of staff from all these uh, four um, universities. Um, and they are excellent and very skilled people. Uh, and I would like to extend a special thanks to them um, today. Um, without their relentless effort, uh, we would not have been able to have this inauguration um, today. Uh, since the establishment of Sigma 2, we have seen a steady increase in assignments, funding and uses. The funding for new infrastructure has almost doubled over these far past four years. Um, on the international collaboration, Sigma 2 is representing Norway in several uh, different uh, places related to high performance computing. We have the Partnership for Advanced Computing in Europe, also called PRAISE and EuroHPC. And this gives researchers in Norway access to resources that we cannot afford in Norway. Uh, furthermore, participating in international collaboration such as the Nordic e-infrastructure collaboration, also called NAIC, and the Open Science Cloud EOSC, helps building better e-infrastructure services uh, and enable Norwegian researchers to collaborate across uh, borders. Um, then I'll say some words about the industry. Um, industrial research in Norway have so far used very little of our resources, actually less than 3%. Of course, there are companies in Norway that have their own high performance computing resources, but there are many companies that can benefit from HPC and Sigma 2 has been given the responsibility for the National Euro HPC Competence Center in Norway. Here we collaborate together with Sintef and NORS. This center has a special responsibility to help more of the industry to start using high performance computing and doing that by offer training and specific help in how to use HPC. Uh, in 2019, Sigma 2 was evaluated by an international committee. They gave a clear recognition to the work Sigma 2 and our partners have achieved over these past five years. The committee gave a very strong recommendation to use Sigma 2's organization and um, the as the foundation uh, for the future of e-infrastructure in Norway. And our partners and the Research Council of Norway have acted upon these recommendations. And I'm very happy to today also announce that they are doubling the base funding um, for this um, work. Um, this will enable us to continue to provide an excellent infrastructure for researchers, for research innovation as well as education in Norway. Now about Betsy. The availability of Betsy is great news for researchers in Norway. We will, with the introduction of Betsy, almost double the capacity for computing in Norway. We have two excellent machines in Fram and Saga. Fram for large parallel jobs and Saga especially tailored for jobs that needs to operate on lots of data, for instance in the bioinformatics area. We are at the same time saying goodbye to two very old machines, Vilja and Stalo. They have showed a perseverance way beyond our expectations and they have been running now for almost eight years. And we will get back with um, some other time with some of the achievements of these uh, machines. From Sigma 2's point of view, we see a growing demand for high performance uh, computing and data storage. 
The range of domains that is using HPC is huge. From the traditional areas such as physics and chemistry to economy, health and even language research. And as our host told you, we will later hear directly from some researchers about what great, great science they can do with Betsy. Finally, some words of thanks. I have already mentioned the staff at our partnering, collaborating universities. They, together with the staff at Sigma2, have worked very hard to plan, procure and put uh, Betsy in operation. I would also like to thank the university for trusting us with the responsibility um, of having this e-infrastructure. And Uninet, our parent company, for providing great resources. We have an excellent board in Sigma2. They bring an experience and insights that we have greatly benefited from. And they have been great supporters of a national e-infrastructure. The Research Council of Norway and the Ministry for Research and Education have also shown great support with the funding for Betsy and the rest of our infrastructure. And I will especially give thanks to Åse Marte Horingmo uh, from the Ministry for giving a speech here today. Betsy will bring lots of new opportunities for researchers in Norway. And we look forward to welcome old and new users of high performance computing to experience the capacity and power of Betsy. Thank you very much. Thank you for that insight, good night. Um, and I think we are in for some new knowledge as well uh, when we have gathered not only one, but two professors in order to tell us a little bit more about the pure genius behind the name Betsy. Uh, you might think capability and capacity beat names when it comes to supercomputers, but good night, you landed Betsy. Yes, uh, we had a competition for a new name and uh, Betsy won the competition and it's a very exciting name because of the history. And to tell us a little bit more uh, about Betsy's history, uh, we are now going to listen to Professor Kari Hag. Yes. Thank you for inviting us to present Betsy or Marianne Elizabeth uh, Stefansen, as was her full name. She wrote uh, El Elizabeth with S before she was in her middle 30s. She had her name from her English uh, maternal grandmother. So Betsy uh, she was born in Bergen, as you see. She, she was the oldest of seven children. Her parents were Gerke Reimers Jan and Anton Stefan Stefansen. Betsy's father had opened a textile shop in Bergen in 1870 as a first step towards opening his own factory, Janusfabrikken in Espeland. After a happy childhood, uh, Betsy entered Bergen Cathedral School. Two other girls started at the same time, and these were the first girls in a boys' school. Women could study at the university in Oslo at this time. Why didn't Betsy go there instead of Zurich? We know a little about how this came about through a letter her mother wrote to support an application for a grant from Queen Josephine's endowment. So uh, Betsy's mother is writing, Betsy, our oldest daughter, graduated last summer with honors. 
Her inclination and desire was to study mathematics. If she were to study natural sciences at our university, it would take six years and she would have to study many other subjects she has no interest in. Since our university provides more of an education for governmental officials than an education in particular subjects. Therefore, she was allowed to travel to the Polytechnicum in Zurich, where she registered in the mathematics department and did very well on the entrance examination, which was very difficult. She was, for example, the only Norwegian who passed and over a hundred of all those who took the examination failed, all of all nationalities, of course. Zurich and Paris were the only places that a woman could be accepted. We chose Zurich as a polytechnicum. There is highly recommended, and we thought it would be cheaper than Paris. Betsy graduated from um, in 1896, the same year as women got the right to become high school teachers in Norway. But it took 10 years before a woman was employed as a tenured teacher. So Betty took part-time teaching jobs while working on her doctoral dissertation which was approved in 1902. Then she moved to the Oslo area after a visit to, to Göttingen, wrote some more papers and was employed at the Norwegian Agricultural uh, College where she worked until she retired in 1937 and moved to her sister Gerda's place in Espeland. She never married, but uh, um, was engaged all of three times, according to her niece that I interviewed some time ago. After the war, she was awarded the King's Medal of Merit for the efforts she had made to help the Norwegian prisoners in the German prison camp at, uh, at Espelon. And as you see, she died in Espelon in February 1961. I think Betsy was a true pioneer. She was, in fact, the first Norwegian woman to obtain a PhD, not only in mathematics, but in science. And it was not until 1971 that another woman, Norwegian woman, obtained a PhD in, in mathematics. Stefansson's name is now in the news, which I appreciate very much. In addition to giving her name to the new computer, there is a, an Elizabeth Stefansson lecture and in March, the road sign for Elizabeth Stefansson's way in Oz was unveiled. A fascinating story. And as Cody said, a true pioneer and a role model to many women. Maybe unknown to many. Indeed. Uh, and I guess typically so, if you Google uh, Betsy Stevenson's name, uh, you get maybe a little bit too much information about her father being a pioneer at commercializing and producing wool underwear. And we still know uh, uh, under the brand name Janus today. But just to be absolutely clear, in this family, Bessie Stevenson was the true role model and pioneer and the hero. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so, uh, uh, Now we know a little bit about Betsy, uh, but maybe we should get 
uh, a little bit more information about her scientific yeah. work. So, uh, and to learn about that, uh, we uh, are going to listen to a professor at the, the, the Department of Mathemat Mathematical Science, Peter Lindqvist. My name is Peter Lindqvist. I am professor of mathematics at NTNU. I shall say a few words about the scientific work of Marianne Elizabeth Stephenson. She published four scientific research papers on differential and on difference equations. Later, she wrote many reports on the weather and temperature at Oz, where she worked. Her most important work was the doctoral thesis printed in Christiania in 1902, for which she got a doctoral degree, degree the same year from the University of Zurich. And here she characterized those uh, partial differential equations of the fourth order in two independent variables that can be reduced to an equation of only the third order. Uh, it has a so-called intermediate integral. First, she reduced the problem to a system of 10 nonlinear partial differential equations, which she carefully analyzed. We have 80 pages of dense calculations, a real tour de force. The next publication, von der Bewegung eines Continuums mit einem Ruhepunkte, came in 1903. It was inspired by David Hilbert's lectures in Göttingen, which she attended. Hilbert was one of the most famous mathematicians, and he is well known still today. The introduction with Hilbert's lectures mentioned in it was impressive, but the problem boil, boiled down to a linear system of ordinary differential equations with three unknown functions. Today, examples of this kind abandon in textbooks. Our engineering students nowadays would find no difficulties in interpreting and admiring her carefully drawn trajectories. Some of the pictures now decorate the new supercomputer. Stephenson also studied difference equations. Here, differentials are replaced by finite differences. So much about her work in mathematics. Stephenson used her knowledge in physics to study the temperature of the soil at different depths. From a huge statistical material collected at Oz, she calculated that at the depth of 15 meters and 79 centimeters below the surface, the annual variation of the temperature was only one hundredth of a degree cent centigrade. That is negligible. From this, she could conclude that the daily temperature variation was uh, negligible at the depth of 82 centimeters. A formula of Fourier seems to have been used. One may ask, why did she not just uh, measure the temperature at the depth of 82 centimeters? First, she couldn't know that the answer was 82. Second, she needed a long statistical material and the calculations and measurements were made at two o'clock in the afternoon, which was not the optimal time. So therefore, she had to find a certain constant by first calculating from the annual variations. So at the end, it was a, an ingenious setup. Thank you for your attention. We now know how, how a pseudo, uh, what a suitable name Betsy is. And as we watched uh, Peter's introduction uh, into uh, Betsy's uh, scientific research, we also saw that some of the mathematical formulas, as you can see on the picture behind us, they are part of the design of the machine itself. Now we have had a very thorough uh, introduction to the name behind the supercomputer. 
and it's high time we get into what the supercomputer can do. Uh, we're going to uh, get some introductions from two researchers uh, and they will tell us what Betsy can contribute in their line of research. First, we're going to listen to um, Andrea Gruber at uh, Sintef Energy. And Gunnar, who is Andrea Gruber? Well, as you uh, mentioned, he um, works at um, Sintef. Uh, Sintef is one of Europe's um, largest independent research organizations. Um, he's not only a senior research scientist at Sintef, but he's also a professor at NTNU at the Department of Energy and Process Engineering. So um, let us hear about um, his research. Dear uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, attendees of the inauguration of uh, the Betsy supercomputer, uh, my name is Andrea Gruber and I was asked by the organizers to present um, an insight about uh, um, the use uh, that we at Sintef Energy Research uh, do of supercomputing and in which uh, research context uh, this is done and uh, provide some examples. So this presentation will uh, uh, give just that. So uh, first of all, uh, some acknowledgement. Uh, as you see, we collaborate with both the private sector in the uh, gas turbine OEMs uh, and the ener an energy company like Equinor. Um, of course, uh, there are some institutional uh, um, uh, partners that uh, provide part of our funding and also many academic collaborators that uh, I will not list now one by one, but that uh, are um, uh, shown in the pictures. So, uh, first of all, a uh, brief outline of my presentation. I will provide the context about uh, the clean and efficient thermal power cycle. So why uh, we do this research. And uh, then I will provide um, an overview over the methodology that we use and why we need uh, high performance computing to do that. Uh, then I will uh, also provide some examples uh, of use of supercomputing in this context. And finally, some uh, challenges, uh, future, future challenges and, and the outlook. So, um, air breathing thermal power cycle, uh, as I say here, they are powering the world today. Uh, they go from gas turbines for uh, land-based power generation to reciprocating engines and to uh, aerial gas turbines for uh, uh, travel, um, for airborne travel. Uh, they have in common uh, that they leverage on a working fluid, which is air, uh, utilizing a very small uh, amount of fuel in comparison to the working fluid to produce mechanical work or electric power. Um, so they use the oxygen as an oxidant to enable chemical reaction, but they leverage on the nitrogen, which is available in the air to achieve huge power scaling. And this is the main advantage of these cycles uh, in respect to electrical and electrochemical conversion, which cannot enjoy this uh, huge scaling. So the main takeaway here is that thermal power cycles are not uh, intrinsically dirty, but uh, as clean as their combustion technology and fuel they utilize. So simpler fuels chemically uh, mean uh, cleaner exhaust. And hydrogen, which we are studying at Sintef Energy Research, is one of such fuel. Very simple and very clean. One of the things I noticed here, uh, Gunnar, was the very impressive list of uh, collaborators, uh, some of the most uh, world's most famous universities. Uh, so how can Betsy be of help in, in the research of energy? Um, in this case, it's a very important uh, research um, for the industry in terms of how they can make uh, better engines and also using new fuels. And it's also important for you and me and for a cleaner environment. Okay, 
So let's hear more in detail about his research. So here in this talk, I will present briefly, very briefly, uh, three examples uh, in which uh, DNS has been used in this canonical unit problems uh, that are relevant for application. Uh, the main reason why we do this is uh, hydrogen firing of gas turbines uh, that poses uh, important RD challenges because of the uh, high reactivity of hydrogen. And DNS here provides key insight. So one problem is the fuel injection, so that uh, it's also known as a, in, as a canonical problem, the jet and cross flow configuration. Another problem is the flame flashback in which uh, the a premix flame uh, moves away from its uh, stabilization position um, in an unwanted um, direction. Uh, and also, um, we have used DNS to uh, examine um, auto-ignition stabilized flames at three heat condition. I will come back to what this means uh, more in detail. So I have to acknowledge, of course, uh, our collaborators at the Combustion Research uh, Technology Group of Ansaldo Energia, formerly Alstom, in Baden, Switzerland, that were instrumental in the definition of all of this, uh, of most of these DNS cases. Good night. I have to admit it. This is a bit complicated uh, for me. Can you try to explain what this means? What are these examples? Uh, well, he um, first speaks about the limitations of um, experiments, of lab experiments, and how high performance computing can, um, is needed um, for this, uh, both for data completeness, but also they are saving a lot of money on experiments when they can model this in the computers. Um, Andrea states that uh, without HPC, um, they couldn't even have done these advanced um, direct numerical simulations or DNS as he calls them. Um, to put it very simply, uh, we need HPC and DNS to have good um, hydrogen fueled engines. Uh, but further into his presentations, he also talks about the need for collaboration between physicists and computer scientists. Um, these um, experiments that they are doing, they need a lot of computing powers, tens of millions of these computing units. Um, and the software really need to be fine-tuned for this. Um, this was of course a simplification. Uh, uh, but for those of you who want to get all the details of this very interesting presentation, you will find the full uh, presentation uh, on our YouTube channel after uh, this broadcast. Uh, now let's hear uh, Andreas' um, summary. Finally, my summary and outlook. Uh, so direct numerical simulation and uh, high performance computing have enabled unprecedented insight into key physical processes, facilitating development of low carbon technology. O oops, I went the right, the wrong way. So DNS is uh, now a mature fundamental research tool and early adopters have also supported this uh, into the development, into research and development of applied, uh, uh, of applied um, uh, in combustion equipment. Uh, the transition to exascale will automatically allow DNS of high, uh, at high Reynolds number, larger domains, and more complex chemical kinetics, but not necessarily all of this at the same time. It is uh, clearly recognized also that our algorithmic improvements, uh, for example, Legion and adaptive mesh refinements are necessary to proceed significantly closer to device size uh, DNS calculation. In general, uh, proper DNS or turbulent reactive multi-phase flow, uh, multi flows uh, is and will remain elusive. This is due to the complexity of multi-phase and the fact that even the, the basic models are not uh, easy to represent even at the uh, DNS level. So uh, finally, important limitations have to be expected in performing DNS of slow processes that uh, are characterized by long time scale. Uh, and this is due to the integra integrated timescale limitations that I, are, I have referred to. 
So this was it. And uh, I conclude uh, my presentation now. Gunnar, still a bit out of my reach. Could you please summarize it in your words? Well, this is very important uh, research, uh, both for the industry, uh, but also, as I mentioned, for a cleaner environment. Okay, so now let us hear another researcher, uh, researcher that will be using the capacity of Betsy. Natalia Reuter at the University of Bergen. Who is Natalia Reuter, uh, good night. Um, Natalie Reuter is a professor at the Department of Chemistry and uh, Computational Biology Unit at the University in uh, Bergen. Uh, she's also a member of the Scientific Steering Committee of PRAISE, uh, which is composed of um, a Europe's leading researchers uh, responsible for giving uh, guidance and advice on scientific and technical matters. She will speak about proteins and membranes. So let us hear what HBC uh, has to do with proteins, membranes and venomous spiders. Hello, I'm um, Nathalie Reuter at the University of Bergen and I would like to tell you about molecular simulations of peripheral membrane proteins. Um, First of all, uh, I'm a computational biologist and also a, a theoretical chemist by education. And my research group and I, we are very much interested in uh, proteins. Proteins are fairly large molecules. They contain thousands of atoms. And even this, the one that I have uh, drawn here on that uh, slide is one of the smallest one we work with. And still it has 2,000 200 atoms approximately. And then we're also very much interested in cell membranes because we study those proteins that bind and act on cell membranes. So cell membranes are simply the barrier uh, that contains the cell and its component. These are the black lines here. You can see it as a bag that contains the, the, the cell inside, so to speak. And there are membranes around the other organelles, the mitochondria, the nucleus, et cetera, et cetera. So we're talking about cell membranes, plural, and not only one cell membrane. So cell membranes, they consist of uh, phospholipids or lipids in general. They are fairly small molecules, at least smaller than proteins. And those cell lipids, they, uh, those, sorry, those lipids, they can be described as consisting of two parts the heads, which are made of chemical groups that are polar or charged. And therefore the head is hydrophilic and likes to be in contact of water-like environments. And those molecules, the lipids, they also have uh, tails, which are nothing else than long carbon chains with or without unsaturations. And they are therefore hydrophobic. They really don't like to be in contact with an aqueous environment. So when lipids come together, they will have their tails facing each other and they will form a bilayer, which is basically what a biological membrane is. Um, those membranes, they are very complex. So they contain many different lipids, which are here just represented by the different colors of the heads. They have shorter or longer tails. They can have uh, no, non, no insaturations or one or more insaturations. And we also have small molecules like cholesterol. And then there are also membranes. There are also proteins in those membranes, sorry. And those proteins, they can be transmembrane protein, like the blue one, meaning that they traverse the whole membrane. Um, for example, transporting things from one side of the membrane to the other. And we also have uh, the so-called peripheral membrane proteins, which we are very much interested in. And those are like the green um, uh, drawing here. They interact with only the surface of the membrane and they will insert some parts of, of themselves. So some parts of the protein will be inserted between the lipid tails. So 
um, in the hydrophobic core of the membrane, a region which will only accept hydrophobic chemical groups or hydrophobic amino acids. The rest of the protein is exposed to the solvent and fairly hydrophilic. So we are very much interested in what are the driving force taking those soluble proteins to an environment where their hydrophobic regions will be well, um, uh, well anchored. So we look at the forces. We sometimes run so-called free energy calculations to understand the binding. And we also look in very much details uh, as to what's happening between those chemical groups here, which amino acids interact with which lipids and how. Um, and those proteins, it's clear they need to stay quite a while at the, at the membranes to do their job before they leave again. And we know very little about uh, how long they stay. In the case of that protein, a collaborator of mine, Anne, at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst in the US, has measured or estimated uh, experimentally that this protein stays for about uh, 380 milliseconds at the membrane. This is a very short time, <clears throat> sorry for our scales, but it's quite challenging for us to study. We use molecular dynamic simulations, which is, I think, the best tool for exactly that type of problems, which uh, actually solve the Newton's equations of motions for each particle of the system. We use a molecular mechanics description of the particles uh, in the molecule so that we can calculate the forces between the different particles. And we use, in general, the CHARM36 force field. The engine we use for molecular dynamic simulations is most often an MD2. We also use another one called CHARM based on OpenMM. And typically the integration step for our simulations will be in the order of one femtosecond or two. So if we're gonna simulate milliseconds, this is quite a number of integration steps we have to perform. I want to show you two examples uh, very quickly. The first one uh, are phospholipases D. So those are proteins that are found in the venom of brown spiders. These are not spiders I would like to meet. They are quite venomous. And um, the phospholipases D, what they do is they uh, bind to the cell membrane uh, on the cells of their prey, and they will start degrading the lipids there. And that has a number of sequence consequences for the prey, and it, it really isn't good uh, for it. Um, the thing is that different uh, brown spiders will have slightly different phospholipases D, which will give them the ability to attack different types of lipids. So we were trying to understand what uh, gives this what what are the the reasons for that so we run simulations uh, here is just a, a small summary of it we run simulations of three different enzymes and that was done by emmanuel motusami in my group um, and could see as is known by experiments by the way that exactly this enzyme doesn't really like to bind to that type of lipids which are phosphatidylcholine lipids pc but those two other enzymes that come from two different spiders, they can actually bind to the lipids. So far, so good. We have only reproduced what we know from experiments, but it's always good to see that we can do that uh, only with computer simulations. The interesting thing is that now when we have those simulations, we can go and check in detail what the interactions are, which, are, which amino acids on that enzyme and that enzyme allow it to go to these uh, membranes. <clears throat> and we actually found out a number of aromatic amino acids in both enzymes. <clears throat> Sorry, and those amino acids are located at about the same place in each of the enzymes. They make cation pi interactions with the choline head groups of the lipids, and those uh, form a cage, which is not found in the ST enzyme. So it explains why they recognize and, and can process different uh, lipids. So 
now when we run these simulations um, we have to run we have to use uh, high performance computers they take quite a while so for these simulations we used um, the computer called fram and there we would use about four and a half days for each uh, of those simulations mind you there is a little bit of pre-processing we run duplicates or triplicates when we when we run such simulations and we have in this study in total probably i don't know about 20 simulations so the simulation time is extremely important using betsy which we benchmarked for a system of about the same size this simulation would have been done within three days for each of them with 32 nodes uh, and 32 cores per nodes um, with uh, 60 uh, with 48 nodes uh, and 64 cpus per node we could have less than a day per simulation so it really accelerates our simulation to use a more powerful uh, hpc this benchmark were done by dan dan who's a software engineer in my research group Another example now. The system I just showed you was one of the simplest, or sorry, one of the smallest proteins we're looking at. I want to tell you a little bit about lipid transfer proteins. These are proteins that transfer, uh, transfer lipids from one membrane to another one, like here. The use of the protein is that it's going to shield the lip, the the hydrophobic tails and therefore facilitate the transfer from one membrane to the next. Here is a simulation that was run by uh, Mahmoud Mokadam, who's a postdoctoral researcher in my group. And if you follow the blue lipid, you will see that slowly this lipid is going to insert one of its tails into the protein, which is in yellow. We need fairly long simulations to do that. And the length of the simulation is um, uh, much longer than the previous ones. We would like to have up to a microsecond or even more. A microsecond simulation on FRAM would have taken us 25 days for one microsecond. And I remind you that we run many more simulations than the one I'm just showing on the screen. With, uh, on Betsy, which is what has been used mostly now for that system uh, over the summer, we can go down to 12, 10 or uh, less than eight days for only one microsecond. So it's a tremendous uh, improvement. And the most important thing here is that we can study larger systems. So to conclude, I would like to say that um, I've mentioned we run free energy calculations as well, which are slightly more demanding simulations than the one I showed. The importance of this work is that it's helping um, understanding better the interactions between the proteins and the lipids and hence it will become easier to target these proteins in drug discovery uh, campaigns. If you weren't um, convinced already now, CPU is uh, CPU intensive, um, oh, sorry, uh, CPU time is absolutely decisive for this type of activity and the very important thing here is that now with access to a, a more powerful supercomputer we can simulate larger and more realistic systems more comparable to experiments in the wet lab and with this i will uh, thank you for your attention and thank sigma 2 and the research council for funding our research um, and i'm Some very interesting research there, Gunnar. And who would think that it would be room for spiders inside a supercomputer? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I understand that this research can be used in uh, med medical studies. And um, Natalie talked about uh, simulations running for a very long time. Uh, Gunnar, what is actually happening inside Betsy uh, when they run these simulations for days and days? Yeah, so to say it very simply, it's uh, mathematics converted into computer language and then that's transferred to thousands of processes that run in parallel and communicate with each other in very high speed. 
Um, and the time series here are huge. Uh, I don't think a lot of people have even heard about femtoseconds. Mm. So they have to compute all these fragments and put them um, together. Mm. Uh, and I, I heard that she talked about uh, simulations running for a month before they got the results, but now they were down to week, a week. Yeah, so this is uh, great news, as uh, Professor Reuter said. So this also means that we can give access to even more researchers that can perform great science uh, on our machines. Mm. We're also going to hear uh, some words from uh, another person that is really happy about Betsy. No wonder. Uh, because uh, we're going to listen to a greeting from uh, Senior Vice President at the supplier of Betsy, yeah. uh, Agnes Boudot from Atos. Dear Uninet Sigma 2 team, dear Mr. Burr, I'm really happy to have the opportunity to participate to this inauguration event. And I'd like to congratulate you for this milestone of having the most powerful supercomputer installed in Norway. This supercomputer will enable Uninet Sigma 2 to provide HPC services and AI services in the future. And this is what Norwegian researchers need today. Also, it will support Norway in different European collaboration programs, your HPC, PRAISE, and Atos will be happy to collaborate on any of these topics, HPC, AI, or quantum. We are proud that Uninet Sigma 2 has selected Atos XH2000 technology as the most efficient HPC platform available on the market. This is the real example of Atos' commitment to decarbonization effort. Betsy Supercomputer has been one of the first AMD ROM-based XH1000 platform installed early 2020. It is also ready to host GPU blades to bring convergence of HPC and AI to the users community. Finally, I'd like to emphasize the cooperation collaboration during the COVID-19 period where we could not send people on site due to the lockdown situation. And especially Uninet Senior Advisor, Aja Stanton, who did an excellent job to bring Betsy in an optimum shape. So long life to Betsy, but I wish this supercomputer would be the right useful instrument for science research. Thank you again, and I'm looking forward to visiting you as soon as it will be possible to travel again. It's not hard to understand that she is happy, Gunnar. Uh, and uh, this uh, delivery has uh, been done during some strange time as well. Yes, uh, indeed. Crisis uh, often brings uh, creativity. Um, we met uh, quite big obstacles um, due to COVID both in getting the components um, that we needed, but also getting engineers um, to Norway that could finalize the um, installation. Um, so uh, one of our engineers, Helge Stranden, he set up a very clever live video uh, stream um, to the Artos engineers um, so that they could guide him uh, remotely um, and then um, yeah, he could put the components uh, together. Uh, and in the end, this remote guiding wasn't even needed because he built very good trust uh, with Atos. Mm. Now the time has come for us to get some words from uh, uh, the Norwegian government. And to do that, uh, we have uh, been so fortunate to get uh, the state secretary yeah. of uh, the Ministry of uh, Research and Higher Education uh, Åsa Marte Horigmo. Uh, let's listen to what she has to say. Dear ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure and honor to be here today at the formal opening of the new supercomputer Betsy. I hope that as soon as the loosening of the pandemic restrictions allows for it, 
I'll get the chance to come to Trondheim and admire Betsy in person. But first of all, let me commend your choice of name. We've already heard from Professor Kari Hoog what a remarkable woman Betsy Stefansson was. She was a pioneer and she's still a good role model for women who want to break new barriers. It certainly is appropriate to honor her by naming the supercomputer after her. And I do hope that also this Betsy will help us break new barriers. I'm fascinated by the history of computing in Norway. And I've heard stories about Nusse, Norway's first computer in the 1950s. And I've seen photos. There was nothing Nusli about the size of Nusse. The rapid development in computing power since then is nothing but mind-boggling. We have high expectations as to what we hope that more computing power can help us achieve. We've already heard from senior researcher Andrea Gruber from Sintef explain how Betsy will help them in their research for better engines that run on hydrogen. Professor Natalia Reuter has given us insights into how the new machi machine will make possible sophisticated simulations of proteins and cell membranes. And we are truly grateful for the critical help from HPC in our efforts to manage the COVID crisis. Let me add a couple of examples also from my side. The government is currently wor working on a national strategy for circular economy. Life cycle assessments and material flow analysis are key elements for gaining an overall picture of the environmental impacts of different products from cradle to grave. Such analysis demand large data sets and immense computing power. Norway is also working hard to follow up the Paris, uh, Paris Agreement. We have to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. But even if emissions are reduced significantly in the coming decades, it will take time for global warming to reverse. Therefore, we also need to prepare for climate adaption. We need climate models that can provide the necessary lo local insights into how climate change will affect the risk of floods, floods landslides and extreme weather. Such models require increasingly higher resolution in time and space and thereby more calculations and bigger machines. Let me add that from an environmental perspective, I was happy to learn that 100% of the heat that Betsy generates will be reused on the Antenu campus. And that is no small achievement. In the first long-term plan for research and higher education back in 2014, the government launched three plans for escalating appropriations and among them was a plan for research infrastructure. In the revised long-term plan in 2018, the government points specifically to the need for capacity and competence when it comes to e-infrastructure. We are celebrating the positive results of these policies here today. And Betsy is one of the projects that have been funded through the infrastructure program in the Research Council with a budget of 130 million kroner. And last year, Sigma 2 got the new regular grant of 200 million, topped up with an additional extraordinary grant of 137 million kroner. But the high quality and these national investments would not have been possible had it not been for the local investments and the good collaboration between the four oldest universities and the Research Council of Norway. It is their joint effort that paved the way for Uninet Sigma II. Today, the operation of this infrastructure is carried out through a meta-centre with participants from all these organisations. And I, I am told that they are doing an excellent job with some of the highest qualified people available for the support of researchers in Norway. I know that a new and restructured funding model for e-infrastructure through Sigma 2 is under discussion. I hope that together you will succeed once more in establishing a more robust and economically sustainable model. We need to join forces nationally if we are to succeed internationally. It is important that Norway is a member of the Euro-HPC joint undertaking. 
International cooperation is vital to make sure that Nor Norwegian researchers can compete and perform on the most powerful computers in the world. Together with the Ministry of Local Government and Modernization and the European Commission, we have also funded the National EuroHPC Competence Centre. Through this centre, Sigma2, together with Sintef and Norse, will collaborate to help business in Norway make better use of supercomputers to improve their innovations, products and ultimately their revenue. I wish you all the best with this important task. And finally, I want to give you a challenge. I know that you are already working along several lines to achieve better gender balance within high-performance computing. And I appreciate your efforts, because we cannot afford to waste talent. And it is a waste of available talent if we are unable to recruit and maintain a reasonable gender balance. Let me end by congratulating the researchers in Norway with Betsy and with the opportunities for exciting new research and new solutions for a better world. Thank you. This event is soon coming to an end. Good night. But before that, we have to thank everybody that has taken part in the ceremony. Mm. And uh, I guess... The only thing left for us to do now, Gunnar, is to power up Betsy. And I hope that you all will be joining us on the virtual tour afterwards. So, good night. Yes. <clears throat>